you have an idea, you have a model, now you need a location. Well, where do you begin? Understand what's around you. You're photographing in a local park. What's going to be quiet? What's going to give you different textures? Jump on Google, jump on Peer Space. You'll begin to understand your environment if you haven't been there before. You can go on local Facebook groups. You can go uh, to local camera clubs. Of course, you can go to Google Earth and, and look above and understand what's, what's happening. Also, make sure you have an app called Sunseeker where it tells you where the sun is going, where it's setting, and then you can begin to understand what that light's going to do in that particular environment. And then as you start to shoot a little bit more, you'll know that at this time, this location will be the best, and so on and so forth. I knew that this location will work well in sort of afternoon sun, and at the dry lake bed, for example, I want long shadows, and I know that the sun sets in that location about 40 minutes before it actually sets because we have mountains, so you have to allow for that. You'll actually make a lot of mistakes before you actually get it right most of the time. I don't really scout a location unless I can scout the location specifically at the time that I'll be photographing it. If I'm, at, let's say, approaching a wedding or an event and I've never been to that location before, I will go to that location in the morning, maybe give myself half an hour or so, and just walk around to know what's possible. Then I'll see where the sun is setting and I'll begin to understand where exactly the light will be for the particular time that I'm photographing. So in other words, you prepare as best as you can under the circumstances, and depending on who you're photographing, what you're photographing, you'll modify, you'll chop and you'll change, and you'll just do the best you can. It goes without saying, but you need to be prepared. Now, in terms of charging your batteries, make sure they're all done, make sure that your cards are all formatted, ready to rock. If you're shooting with more than one camera, make sure that you've got time and date stamped on everything, that everything is synced perfectly well. And of course, you wanna be efficient in front of your client or even if it's in front of a friend. You don't wanna get there and be floundering with your gear and floundering with things that you should be prepared for. So make sure that you do all those things. You, you allow time for lunch. You allow time for literally putting the gear in your car, going to that particular spot. These are things that you won't really know until you start doing it properly, but you'll soon learn that valuable lesson that we've all learned to sort of take your time and control what you can control and expect the unexpected and just have some fun with it. So now we're gonna talk about gear and understanding what I recommend as a minimum kit, if you were just starting out and you only had a small little budget to work out with, and then if you want something a bit more elaborate and a bit more well-rounded gear, we're gonna share that information with you as well. Doesn't matter whether you're doing this as a hobby, whether you're actually photographing for a client, uh, you're a semi-pro, it doesn't really matter. You need to know what to expect and then bring the gear that you have and do the best you can under the circumstances. Now, when you're starting, you may have one camera body, you may have one lens. That's okay, we all start somewhere. But as you grow further, you sort of realize that you need some extra tools to have a little bit of fun. Now, I'm the first person to tell you that the camera is only a tool and you make the difference. And I'm gonna give you an idea of what I would suggest as a minimum kit and then give you an understanding of something a bit more well-rounded. So obviously, if you're not shooting for a profession, as in no one's relying on you for these photographs, one camera body is totally fine. No problem at all. In my case, this is my go-to camera. I have two of these. This is the Nikon Z8, which I absolutely love. We have the flagship quality and in a smaller body and form factor. If the battery was a problem for me, uh, let's say if I was shooting sports or something like that and I wanted a bigger grip, I had bigger hands, I would go for the bigger body. But in my case, this fits my hands perfectly. I've got one finger for the shutter, three fingers fit that height perfectly. Now, if I'm photographing, now in this case, I do actually have a backup in here, which was the, the Z6 II. I actually had to add a little bit of an L bracket, a small rig L bracket. Just gives you a little bit of extra room to play with, and it gives you an Arca Swiss plate where you can put on your tripod, which is actually very, very handy. So this is now gonna become my go-to zoom camera. So if I want to actually do a really good quality zooms, I'm gonna put this on the camera, 85 1.8. I'm gonna put it on AFC, Auto Area AF, and this will focus on me. And all I need is an HDMI cord running to my computer with simply a capture card, which is pretty much a glorified dongle that fits on HDMI on one end and USB-C, depending on your computer, on the other end. So Z6 II is going to be that for me. If I was to choose one lens and one lens only, and I had to survive shooting an event or a portrait with one, what would it be? It would be the 24 to 120. Now you might say, well, wouldn't you choose something shallower than that? Well, sure, if, if all things were, 
were possible, I'd go 24 to 120 f.01, but that's not going to happen. You, you have to give and take depending on your specs. The 24 to 120 is great because it gives you wide, gives you telephoto and everything in between. And I'd sacrifice that perfect sort of bokeh and that shallow depth of field um, for the sake of giving myself more room to play. Now, what else would you need for, for a, a decent, well-rounded kit without going to beast mode? Well, you need something possibly even wider than that still. So what do I have? I've got a 14 to 24 millimeter F2.8. Gives me that range beforehand without being too fishy, so to speak. I don't really like the fisheye lens because you hardly ever use it. It's only applicable in some ways, but the 14 millimeter to 24 is great and 2.8 constant actually works out really well. Now, assuming that you either don't like the 24 to 120 or don't want it, and you just want the 24 to 70 2.8, that's like a must to have. Now, that being said for me personally, I don't use a 24 to 70 millimeter that much. I find myself with the versatility with a 24 to 120. I like to use that more often because at an event, at a wedding, for example, I've got a wide shot of the church, for example, close up of the groom, the wide shot of the bride coming in. It really depends. So that really works out really well. And of course you need a longer lens, a 70 to 200. So ideally, one lens only, 24 to 120. If you uh, want the full range, 14 to 24, 24 to 70, and 70 to 200. If you shoot sports or wildlife, you're gonna wanna get your hands on a two by converter uh, or a 400 mil or a 600. Obviously, we, we're now spending a lot of dollars for that. It just depends on your budget and what you do and whether it's worth it for you, whether as a hobbyist or as a vocation. Now, specialty lenses or fast prime lenses, which ones do I have or which ones do I recommend? At the end of the day, it depends on what photography you do. For the last couple of years, I've been really obsessing over the 85 mm f1.8. It's really small, it's very light, it works, it works great. I also have the 50 mm f1.2 lens, which also is amazing. It's a beautiful prime lens. 50 mm is as close as to what you'll get that you see with your own two eyes. So if our eyes were a lens, it's a 50 mm. That's as close as we get. So if you want to emulate real life, so to speak, especially if you're doing filmmaking, a lot of filmmakers will use a full frame camera with the 50 mm lens so that we get an idea of what it was like to be there as a third person observing that particular sort of path as well. Also, one of my favorite lenses is the 105 macro. This is a beautiful lens because you can go really close and Let's say, for example, you do close-up photography. You do you photograph bugs, insects, flowers, whatever, and you need something close-up, and you couldn't quite afford the 7200. This is great because not only will it focus close, don't forget it's a traditional telephoto lens at 105, so that works out really well. So it's important to understand that your gear is, is a bit of a journey in your career. It's a journey in, in your hobby. Invest in the lens that suits your genre and your taste and your budget. Um, that's the, really the best thing I can tell you. Otherwise, if you just buy every little thing that comes out and it's sitting there, it's a problem. My advice to you is maybe borrow five or six lenses, shoot the genre or the subject matter that you love, and then you'll find yourself gravitating towards three of those five lenses. Well, there's your investment. For me, um, honestly, I, I, I will shoot a wedding 80% of the time with my 85 millimeter lens. Then one day I'm like, you know what? I just want a bit of variety today and I'll shoot with maybe four or five lenses. It really depends on the subject matter, the mood that I'm in, and certainly the budget that I have at the time. So just know that we all start with one lens. We may gravitate towards two lenses. So for example, a 24 to 70, 70 to 200. Uh, and then we might expand that and that's okay. My advice to you as well is trade in, trade up. I had gear sitting there doing nothing for years and every day that the camera was on the shelf, it was depreciating in value. So I grabbed all my F mount lenses, my Nikon lenses. I didn't need them anymore because I wanted native mirrorless lenses to suit my current Z8. So I traded them in. I got about 10 grand for like my D3, my D3S, my D4, my D5, my C3PO, anything acronym. Uh, it was crazy. I had all this money sitting there doing nothing. And I thought to myself, well, nostalgia. Well, let me keep one or two of them. Maybe keep your specialty lenses if you have those with, a, with an FTZ adapter or whatever your camera system is relative to, to those terms that you understand. But it's okay, it's a journey. You don't have to get every tool at your disposal because you can, you can afford it, or you just want it. What are you looking for when you're looking for a reflector? Well, certainly you want to use the most versatile reflector that you can possibly have. In this case, most of the time, a five-in-one reflector will be a very, very useful tool. So my favorite tripod, you may have seen me adjusting these knobs when I was actually photographing and 
it gives you these incredible micro movements that you can play with. So if you want to subtly move left and right, you just twist it and it becomes a muscle memory. You want to pan it, you want to sort of move up and down. It's fantastic. It's a Benro head, GD3WH head. And then in this case, I'm using Manfrotto legs and they are the Manfrotto 055 legs, which are pretty much legendary. So Benro head, Manfrotto tripod legs, and it actually works really well for me. And I find that, especially when I'm shooting a portrait, I can just leave it, engage my client, put my camera on auto area AF, AFC, photograph away. I don't have to even look at the, the camera again because it's locked in focus for that particular scene. So a good set of tripod uh, legs and head is really, really important as well. Most modifiers that I use are Westcott modifiers. I think they're made beautifully, made brilliantly. Whether it's a, a five foot Octobox, a seven foot Octobox, the, the family of products in the Westcott range are absolutely amazing and I've been using them for a long time. I personally prefer SanDisk products, not only to capture my images on, but also to store all my work. So I, I'm using the SanDisk Professional Shuttle for my main, I call it my mothership, where my, all my work goes on. And then I use the small, smaller SanDisk Professional Silver Drives um, in a separate location, which really works. It's really important not to be intimidated by what I've just shown you. This has taken me many years to invest in. And it's funny, I feel sometimes really awkward talking about gear because really the gear is only a tool. I don't think chefs hang around and talk about their ovens that they use or tennis players talk about the tennis rackets they use and geek out about that. They geek out about the process. I'm very much process driven. I love the act of photographing. So rather than spend our time geeking out too much about this gear, I'd rather geek out with you with people. In other words, let's photograph, let's have some fun and showing the next episode what we do with the environment around us.